here. Our thought leaders are Dave Stetson and Lewis Medcalf. Dave is a registered architect, certified construction specifier, and founding principal of Conspectus, a specifications and quality assurance consulting firm. Dave will be a speaker at the Construction Specifier Academy February 24th through 26th in Dallas, Texas. Lewis is an architect, certified construction specifier, new grandfather again, and manages the specifications and quality assurance programs for Gresham Smith and Partners, a national architectural engineering interiors and planning firm. For more information on the CSI Academies and webinars, please visit csinet.org. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Your participation during today's webinar is encouraged, and we have allowed time to take questions throughout the presentation. Although attendee audio lines are muted, you may click the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or comment. We will identify you by name and un unmute your line at which point you may begin speaking. If you are participating via streaming audio and do not have a computer microphone, you may also type your question into the chat box. Dave and Lewis, over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the J uh, January um, Specifying Practice Group. I'm glad you're able to all join us, and I see some uh, familiar names on our attendee list. We've asked um, Jessica to open that up so everybody can see who's attending today, and uh, hope that encourages you to participate a bit. So um, today, what we wanted to do is talk about, uh, so you want to be a specifier, and I've got to do a couple more introductions. We have some uh, guests with us today. Uh, one is uh, Bruno Caterini, who's uh, joining us from um, Paris, France. Uh, he and I have been having some conversation uh, over the last several months. And, Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Bruno is actually the one that inspired this um, topic for the presentation. The other is uh, Brian Ross, who's coming to us today from um, Washington State as a um, uh, an architect, I believe, that's uh, wanting or is considering to become a specifier. So what we thought we would do, uh, we have a couple of poll questions that we're going to uh, start here soon, but I'd like to turn it over to Lewis, and the four of us as presenters today are going to just tell you a little bit about how we actually became a specifier and what might be important to us. So, Lewis? Thank you, David. <clears throat> We're really excited about this. Um, uh, writing specifications, writing clear, concise, correct, and uh, in legally enforceable specifications are really a critical task and sometimes uh, gets overlooked or made into a secondary uh, kind of project. And so if there's anything here that we can do to say to, and Dave and I, were, you know, most of the specifiers we know are um, old guys like us, and so anything that we can do or say to encourage uh, younger people to consider this as a career path, um, we're happy to do, and we would be happy to talk with you or exchange emails with you offline, too, when, uh, if you want to contact us at a later date. I, in uh, shortly after I got out of school in 71 or so, in 1976, I started working for a small practitioner, and uh, I was his first employee. And I started. He asked me to start writing the specs for the projects that he did. So I bought the Harold Rosen uh, book and read it through and tried to apply the principles. And then um, in 1982, I was making a job change and applied for a, pro a job and the. Uh, interviewing principal challenged me to become a full-time specifier. He said that they really needed someone to raise the uh, specifications in the firm to the same level of expertise as their drawings and their design. It was a, one of the leading design firm in Cincinnati, Ohio. So uh, uh, I took that as a challenge and uh, of course, I had a wife and three kids that uh, had this habit of wanting to eat regular, so worked out as a good thing. And over the years, it has become, I'm so appreciative that I got laid off, <laughs> that uh, it gave me an opportunity to move in a direction that I don't know that I would have taken otherwise. Uh, but it's been an, uh, an exciting endeavor. I enjoy learning. I, 
enjoy having uh, involvement with multiple projects at a single time, um, getting to work with different teams, uh, different kinds of projects and products, and um, I've just really found this to be a very rewarding uh, career. And on the uh, real practical note, I have survived two or three layoff uh, cycles during recessions because nobody else wanted to write specs. That sounds like a familiar refrain. Um, I, I wanted to let you know my experience is somewhat uh, the same, but not quite as Lewis's. I came out of school in the um, mid-70s. My very first experience was actually uh, performing an energy audit on 65 Army buildings at Letterkenny Army Depot. Uh, after I got done crunching all the numbers and putting together all the drawings that had to go with this, the project architect I was working under informed me that now it was time to write the spec. And at that point, I, I'm sure that my mouth probably dropped open, and I asked him what was a spec, to which he introduced me to the uh, Corps of Engineers uh, specifications at the time. And that was my first introduction. So I ended up actually writing the spec under his uh, careful guidance. And uh, he explained all of the ins and outs for me. And actually, after I got hooked on specs at that point. And afterwards, uh, it was only the next job that I needed to be able to start writing specs full time. Uh, working for Conrail, doing their crew quarters and um, maintenance facilities, and it's been specifications ever since. Um, I'd like to get uh, Brian to tell us a little bit about his experience, and then we'll move over to Bruno. Thanks, Dave Brian? and Lewis. Um, so I graduated uh, a, a little bit after you guys did from college, back in 1992 from architecture school and uh, started working in an architecture firm in 95, a small firm. There's, you know, five people, one art licensed architect, basically um, doing uh, multifamily housing for uh, low-income tenants, and basically, you know, with a small firm, you do everything. So you site design, construction drawings, permitting, all that stuff, but we did do any specifications. So I, I changed jobs, changed cities back in 2001, went to a much larger firm, which at the time was about 80 to 90 people, multidiscipline, civil structural, landscape, all that. And, um, you know, gradually went up the ranks, gaining more responsibility, you know, job captain, then ended up in the kind of project architect role, overseeing, you know, administration of projects and somewhat of the design <clears throat> excuse me but you know I've, I've, I've always been a technical person and I've, I've never been comfortable with my design sense and my you know things like that and management so kind of when I got into that later role it was always difficult <clears throat> and I'd always can you know I'd always thought about specs and you know my the new firm Basically, each project architect wrote their specs for their project, but most of them saw it as a necessary evil, and you know they would just copy a spec from a previous project, you know, change it a little bit and send it out, and hope it worked. So I always, when I had to do mine, I always, you know, I always took it as okay, I got to make this specific to this project, got to make sure everything's right and coordinate it all. So when I got laid off back in February of '09, I've Ever since then, I've, I've been contemplating this, you know, do I really want to change my focus and really go for this specification work? And I've been doing some part-time work for my original firm, writing specs for them, because now a, a lot of the work that they do, they get funding from the state of Washington, and that requires them to have specifications that cover, you know, sustainable applicate, you know, uh, items and, and other things. So that's kind of where I'm at. Okay. Um, Jessica, while we're um, getting ready to head off to the uh, Bruno here, I'd like to ask if maybe um, you could put up poll question number one, and we'll let everybody respond to that while we're getting Bruno to fill us in on his story. Right. Thank you, Dave Lewis, uh, Brian, and good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Italian. Uh, I'm uh, calling you from uh, France, Paris, actually. Here it's like 9 o'clock, uh, 9 p.m. 
I have um, had my architectural education in Venice. My main uh, professor was Adorossi, if, uh, if name, his name means anything to anyone. And um, then I uh, had an opportunity to move uh, to Berlin in uh, Germany, uh, where I spent five years and worked also in a I always worked in practice, architectural practices, since my first uh, year at the university. So I was doing it kind of, uh, starting kind of uh, part-time. And of course, the, the, the work in the architectural practices was more important. I learned much more than at, the, at, the, at school, at the university. Um, so I ended up uh, with an opportunity in Germany uh, with a larger uh, company. Um, and. Um, that's where I uh, decided that uh, my, or I thought that my uh, CV, architecture CV, uh, up to that point was uh, a very good one. So I decided to take six months uh, off um, to try sabbatic, to do, to try and do other things like uh, theater production, um, underground um, and, uh, installation, uh, art, art installations of, of sorts, and, and actually the, the six months became three years. Uh, after which I understood that I should have got back to real to the real world, and the opportunity was given by a company uh, providing uh, actually manufacturing uh, display cases for museums at international level. So I moved back to Italy, to Milan, and was project manager and, and also commercial manager for this company, and worked on. Uh, Victorian Abbey Museum in London, um, uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, um, and Louvre uh, Museum in Paris, many other big museums, large museums. This went on also some years long, and um, you say that this commercial uh, project manager, management phase lasted altogether 10 years, but also for other companies. And actually, becoming a, a specifier represented for me. Uh, a year ago, the opportunity to, to come back to architecture, because as uh, Louis said, nobody wants to, to write specs, and uh, I find the company. I found the company in, uh, in architecture and engineer practice, specialized in airport design at global level I and mean, internationally, um, who was looking here in Paris, who was looking for a specification writer. So I that was exactly the job I was looking for, the role I was looking for. I needed to back to architecture, finding a way, uh, and, and let's say a less orthodox way back in than uh, just being a, a designer. And so I applied for the job and I got it, and uh, it's now like 14 months I've been doing this, and I'm very happy with it actually. I'm, this is a, an unexpected chance to, to find uh, back my way to architecture. Hey. Jessica, do you have the results of the poll? And Jessica, you'll have to help us because as panelists, we're not able to see it. At least I can't. Absolutely. Oh, um, I can see. We had we had a fifty percent um, select that they are a specifier. Twenty six percent selected training to be a specifier. Twenty one percent um, selected considering becoming a and 3% um, said happy being something other than a specifier. And no one picked wishing for another option. <laughs> I and thought that one might be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that last one might have been uh, the real winner in this poll. But uh, thank you very much. So the, the percentage was that we have specifiers on board today, I guess. But very importantly, we have some folks that are considering a change in the career path to uh, move in that direction, and uh, that's very encouraging, at least to me. Uh, we do have uh, one person, uh, a friend of mine, I won't mention his name because I don't want, in, in case he might find it embarrassing, but uh, a good friend whose uh, firm has asked him, he was a, an excellent project architect for many years, very uh, accomplished a CAD uh, operator and knows how to put together and was uh, surprised when his firm asked him to take over uh, managing the specifications for the company. And um, it was, you know, it's like the, uh, the old Shakespearean thing, some people are uh, born to be specifiers, some people use specific 
fire status, and some have it from from twelve. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, can we get the uh, second poll? Just just out of curiosity, since we have a good representation of specifiers, um, trying to find out if somebody has a good how many they really believe that there are. And uh, we might uh, say that when we say specifier, we mean people for whom that is the primary job function, not just a uh, an occasional thing that you do once or twice a year. So how are the results going? Seventy-nine percent have voted. So um, if we'll give it just a couple more seconds, if everyone can finish putting in their um, thought on this. Oh, I think Dave got to tell folks where we're speaking from. I'm speaking from beautiful downtown Music City, Nashville, Tennessee. Right, and I am from uh, Cape May County in New Jersey, uh, practically next to the uh, ocean. All right, I'm going to close the poll. And 47% um, said 44% voted for 20,000, 6% said 200, and 3% said 200,000. Oh, wow. Okay, here's here's my take on this. I I actually believe that there are probably between 1,200 and 1,500 um, that might consider themselves full-time specifiers. And my my basis, just so you have some uh, understanding, there are uh, in Skip the specification. Uh, census, which is from 2007, and considering there's been a bit of a recession in between there, uh, there are only about a million and a half people total involved in engineering, architecture, and related services. So specifiers, if we're at 1,500, we're at a very small minority of the of the folks involved in the industry. And at 1,500, uh, the total number of firms in the country is about 85,000 in architecture and engineering. And of those, about um, 45,000 have more than um, five employees. So considering that the smaller firms, somebody under five employees, probably don't have a specifier or a dedicated specifier. Um, we have about 1,500 people trying to handle the work of about 45,000 firms. Um, so I think there's some opportunities. Definitely. My experience is that um, a firm, it takes at least a firm of at least about 25 people to support a full-time specifier. Right. And I couldn't let this go without giving a special thanks to Bruno today because of our conversation over the past months uh, has what really inspired the topic for this meeting. So thank you very much, Bruno. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to talk about is, you know, why would somebody uh, choose to be a specifier and why now? I mean, the, the economy is down, certainly. Uh, many firms have seen a lot of layoffs. The, the obvious uh, choice might be that uh, somebody is actually making a conscious choice uh, to become a specifier, but I think what you heard Lewis and I say is that ours was more um, chance, I believe, uh, if anything, uh, rather than a conscious choice. It was just circumstances uh, that had driven us to become specifiers. So 
is it a conscious choice? Are we making uh, positive career change choices? Or are we just trying to preserve employment? Um, I think some of it, uh, Brian, I think you're in this kind of a position, are you not? Yeah. It's um, as a result it's, of layoff. Yeah, exactly. It's a, you know, since the, the way the economy is, 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 you know, being a more specialized person, would that, you know, open up more doors for you potentially? It's that's, a that's matter kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Yeah, it's kind of a matter of differentiation. Uh, if you want a, you know, a new uh, job captain, uh, you put an ad in the paper and you'll get more people than you can imagine. But if you, if a firm is trying to recruit a new specifier, they're going to have to work long and hard to find someone. Mm -hmm. That goes back to the numbers again. If the 1,500 is a reasonable estimate, because there are not many to choose from. So we want to talk a little bit about what is a specifier. And we want to, um, this is a, a list that actually I developed jointly with Bruno. Um, I went in and looked at what the manual of practice is saying for CSI and took some of the thoughts from that. And Bruno actually added a, a number, and I'll get him to comment on some of those. Uh, as, a, as a specifier, I try to instill in our clients that we're the technical resource for them. And I think that that's uh, probably true for most specifiers because of the research uh, that they end up doing and the fact that we're working on multiple uh, projects for every one project that a project architect may work on. I think that uh, specifiers are definitely a quality assurance source only because we're coming in at a point where we're not intimately involved in producing the drawings and as a result we can lend a set of fresh eyes to the drawings and be able to um, provide some constructive comments about what we're seeing as we're going through trying to produce the specifications. Uh, as a researcher and technical writer, uh, sure, technical writing is important, but uh, in my estimation that the actual writing the specifications is probably one of the easiest parts. Um, the interface, I, I think, is uh, one of the more important, and I'll, I'll lump that together sort of with the mind reader, and I think I'd like to get um, Bruno to comment on those because these were two of his most important Yes, well, the, for the interface is, um, I like to see how things, I mean, when you try to do something, you end up being good at something different, like when you have an objective, sometimes you end up in hitting good another one. Uh, in this case, what I mean with interface is the fact that because you specify, as I understand from my little experience, is about clarifying and uh, um, looking for information from colleagues and uh, checking with uh, the different departments and uh, different consultants uh, uh, how it works, if it can work and so on, uh, you end up being the one creating the connection between all these different instances and ending up being the interface. So this is why it, I think this is very important, at least for me. And I work on, to be a good interface, you have to establish good relationships with your colleagues and uh, with uh, any stakeholder actually at different levels. And, and, uh, and when you work in an international environment, environment it's also uh, a different uh, cultural level, let's say. And then also, the, the, you mentioned the mind reading thing. Uh, again, uh, I go back to what uh, Lewis uh, said at the beginning, uh, at the very beginning, that specs sometimes are something like a secondary project thing. Um, in fact, specs usually come at the very end, or that's my experience at least. And so you, but you cannot start working in the last two weeks before uh, uh, issuing your document. So you start working earlier, you imagine things, and uh, you try to mind read your, the, the, your colleagues what they intend to do. You try always and, um, to, to anticipate. It's like being a sort of, uh, of a sport script writer. You imagine, you try to imagine where could the story go? Where uh, is it more realistic for the story to go? Uh, and the story, like uh, like it could be, or the plot, 
is uh, it could be a, a synonym for for a project, for a building also, and for the process, of course, that, that um, we go through to to build it. And, and that's a critical. Uh, uh, ability because I know at least one very, very experienced specifier who uh, was unable to make good connections with the firm that uh, the person was working with and they wound up having to separate ways just because they were, were not able to have that clear interaction and communication and understanding of what the design team wanted. The corporate memory is sort of an oddball thing, and I, I just had an instance of that myself this morning where we're working with a fairly large firm, and the project architect is selecting a waterproofing type, and it came down to the fact that uh, I was the one reminding her that the, the corporate, her company, this, the product that she's selecting has never been one that they've used and that they have some very, <laughs> some very serious opinions about what waterproofing is appropriate. So, so hopefully we're helping her to uh, follow their own company um, standards in this case. And the last yes. defense, Lewis, I, I just thought of uh, something you mentioned offline too. What happens when they don't draw it the way you wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you know, under, in the AIA contract forms, uh, drawings and specifications are supposed to be complementary and that they are equal in priority. However, most uh, governmental agencies and many private corporations that have their own general conditions will always put specifications ahead of the drawings. And even where the AIA documents are being used, if you walk into a negotiating room or a, uh, a mediation session or walk into a courtroom, I can guarantee you my set of specs is going to outweigh 3,000 drawings. Right. And you as the specifier will probably be there trying to help defend the case. <laughs> right. Okay. So what does it take to be a specifier? Again, some of these um, qualifications here are coming right out of uh, CSI's manual of practice plus you know, our own experience. Um, the, being able to understand details and be able to comprehend uh, what you're seeing on the drawings is imperative. I think uh, being inquisitive in general and that skeptical outlook, but not to a fault, um, we need to constantly be questioning uh, what we're seeing, what manufacturer product reps are presenting, uh, so that we're looking out for the best interests of our clients. And look past the hype. Yes, yes. And, you know, <laughs> because you can make anything sound good if you have the right words and the right photos. Um, and uh, we need to get down to the detail level and find out how it's working and what's uh, appropriate for the project. I think the um, making the connections it goes back to what uh, somewhat what Bruno was talking about, but this means to be able to look at uh, the drawings and see that there's um, an element on the drawings. I, you know, say that there's uh, uh, a cast stone trim element in masonry, and realize that even if the drawings aren't showing it, that you're going to need pins to hold the cast stone in place. You're going to need flashings to make the masonry wall work to a point where when the drawings aren't showing it, that you're able to take that one piece of information and translate it into uh, what's required to produce a complete spec. The, uh, the, other, the column on the right-hand side is more uh, personal qualification or, or um, that you're going to develop over a lifetime. And I think the, the skilled writer in this case, we see so many examples of um, poor writing that's evident every time I get an email. And I usually collect all those and send them off to my daughter, the English teacher, to use as examples. So be careful what you send me. It may get 
may end up being used in uh, high school English class. Uh, and this from the guy that uh, sent an email back to Brian the other day and spelled his name B R A I N, Brain. Yep, yep, yep. Well, I was giving him a lot of credit, Lewis. That's right, that's right. <laughs> I have to say, I think that sometimes this is something that uh, potential candidates for specifiers find very intimidating. Uh, it's like uh, public speaking, you know, there's a kind of a built-in fear about that. Uh, and really, for writing specs, what we need to do is write short, choppy sentences, unlike what they taught us in, in high school and college. Um, but the thing is to be able to pick the right words, and that does take some practice. It does take some, some skill. But I would hate to think that anybody would be intimidated or inhibited at uh, wanting to become a specifier because we're not looking to write uh, great novels or you know co long complex sentences. Quite the contrary, we want to try to write as simple and plain in English as is possible, or Italian or French for that matter. <laughs> Right. Yeah. With Sorry, can, can I, if I just can add, I think it's quite important. I, I realize how important it is to be precise anyway in the choice of terms. That's what most, the most important thing is. So when you say you really skilled writer on your slide, uh, uh, for me it means also to be able to choose. Uh, uh, doesn't mean to be a good narrator, but to be choose correctly the correct terms. I have uh, lived and worked in uh, Italy, France, England, uh, Germany, and other countries, of course. Uh, I've traveled a lot, and I have seen all different ways of saying things. And also working in an environment, international environment, where both British English and American English are to be found, uh, you, you see how much need there is for making the right choice, being careful in, cho in choosing the, the terms. Yeah, and I, I did add the translation technique, and anybody that's, yeah. that's acting as a specifier knows what that means about being able to read others' handwriting and um, being able to decipher uh, from very cryptic notes as to what exactly they are intending. Reading between the lines and mind reading. Yeah. Yes, exactly. yes, yes. Okay, so where do you start? Well, you can start anywhere, start any time start everywhere. And I would say the, the kinds of things that I'm going to present to you are things that Bruno and I have been discussing over the months and, and I've tried to boil it down to uh, some very uh, cryptic verbs and then some uh, explanation of what each of those mean. So we need to question what we're seeing, question common knowledge, and we need to be able to form our own opinions because what might be common knowledge today is going to change tomorrow. Uh, technology is just changing that rapidly, that we can't rely on what we, what we think we know today because tomorrow it's probably going to be old news. And we need to know when we can throw away some of the older ideas and be able to adopt uh, new ideas. We need to observe need to see what's going on around us. You know, what's happening in your world when you're out. Um, the best example I have uh, about this is you're out and about. Every day we're visiting new places. We're taking in new sights, new sounds. We need to observe what we're seeing more than just looking. We need to observe it. And we need to see what's working well, what does not. And if, you've, if you are an architect, specifier, someone in this design profession, and especially if you have family, this is where it really is noticeable. And you take them out to a restaurant, and your first 15 minutes in the restaurant is looking around trying to figure out what they've done wrong. And your kids are looking at you, rolling their eyes in complete embarrassment. Uh, I think I think you finally hit the nail on the head. <laughs> that, uh, and they're probably uh, wanting to crawl off into a corner somewhere, pretend they don't even know you. So. Uh, and we're talking about not 
necessarily looking at the design of the building, but you know what hardware goes on that door and what sealant. You know, there's a failing sealant next to the the door or the window, and oh man, they got too much condensation on the inside of that window in the winter time and that kind of stuff. Or the two-way air outlet for the HVAC system is actually oriented the wrong way, pointing yes. at the <laughs> spilling all the air right on the wall instead of out into the space. Um, those kinds of things. So uh, we need to just pay attention because we can we can learn from that and be able to translate it into the work that we're producing for specifications to try to help keep our uh, clients and designers out of trouble. Jessica, I see a, a number of folks with um, potential questions showing up in our attendance list. Do you have things out there that we ought to be uh, sharing? We only had um, two questions. Um, what you might be seeing is um, the sign that says that they're idle. Um, but um, we did have one. Um, it, it was just a statement, technically. It says, I always do a punch list to every building I enter. And that's from <laughs> Joseph Anatrella. Aha. So you, car carrying a pad or I hope a mental uh, punch list, that's interesting. And we also had a, another question from Dennis that um, was just wondering um, what program you um, have done your presentation on. Oh, that one's an easy one. It's called Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I. And um, I hope I never have to do another PowerPoint presentation because I really like this. Uh, moving on, I think we need to try to understand what, what it is that we're doing and especially the materials and products that we're having to deal with in the um, construction industry. And this goes back to being the technical resource for our clients and architects. Uh, we're doing tremendous amounts of research and we really become, as specifiers, really become a wealth of information uh, that needs to be shared, uh, needs to uh, get that back out to the architects. Um, I'll go back to on the limitations of uh, materials and products. Uh, CSI spec data sheet, one of the 10 elements on the CSI spec data sheet was actually uh, limitations. And when I was researching new products, that was probably one of the very first places I stopped because it was sometimes you learn more about a product and how it can be used by what it can't do. And if the manufacturers are honest with you and truthful about it, uh, it makes the research much easier because if you can get to that information quickly, you can make a better assessment um, as to whether or not it's useful for you. Okay, and maybe I can get uh, Brian here to jump in, and I know that uh, I'm throwing this uh, curveball at you, Brian, because I'm sure you weren't expecting to talk about any of this. Um, <laughs> But um, what, are, what are you looking for in the way of materials, especially uh, when it comes to uh, looking at, at systems? And are you, are you trying to follow along, uh, trying to define these complete systems? Um, you mean system like, I guess, what do you? Well, if, if you're researching a product or material, uh, mm -hmm. what when we see product data sheets, and, I, and some of the classic examples I can use are for um, laboratory equipment, uh, like a glassware washer, where it comes with about 90 different options. Yeah. And how do we get uh, designers to know that they actually have to select options, and how do we as specifiers know that these products and materials uh, the spec won't be complete unless we do specify those options. Well, all the stuff I've done, we've never had anything that complex. I mean, you know, doing multifamily housing or doing a, a tilt-up warehouse distribution building, you know, a lot of, we generally dealt with the shell 
and finishes and you know our structural engineer would specify the structural aspect and our mechanical guy would do the mechanical and um, a lot of the we never really got into much equipment thing you know for the projects um, but obviously in the shell you know you, you know you may have you know like a drinking fountain that you you know obviously a drinking fountain is going to have a lot of different options to it potentially and you know like I know <clears throat> when we did specs a lot of you know you know for example I did a lot of tilt warehouses distribution buildings so the project manager he generally when he did his spec he would take the spec from the last project he did he would take it change the title on it you know make sure it generally fit what he wanted and off it would go now obviously there's things there that are not going to jive for every single tilt building you do in the world you know you may have different dock doors or dock bumpers or whatever and you know most of those are going to have different options or features that you're going to want depending on where the building is etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think a lot of times that stuff would get overlooked and it would just be okay here's a door and I would take that spec for a building I was going to do and it would be like oh gee they, they really specified that on a building did anybody really catch that and I think a lot you know fortunately for us it was the contractor was always a good guy and we had a good relationship so they always kind of looked out for us and on a tilt up uh, building I think you hit on maybe a couple of things because we see this oftentimes that um, you as a specifier if you're looking at the at the building and the layouts um, can see things such as openings too close to the edge of the panel openings yeah. too large for the size of the panel and that that goes back to this uh, what's forming the complete system because you have to know the limitations and what goes along with the system a related subject a related subject is uh, compatibility that there are different uh, very common and very and good construction materials uh, that can be used uh, successfully by themselves or with the right other materials, but if you um, mix them, you get into problems. Right. There are certain yeah. materials that are incompatible with other materials, is what I'm right. trying to say in a roundabout way. And the tilt-up, I think, goes back to the last point here, to the knowledge of all disciplines, because you're looking at a structural component from an architectural standpoint when it comes to the openings and to be able to understand uh, the limitations of the structure yeah. that applies to architecture. Mm -hmm. So this, this is one of my favorites. Um, I, I spend time actually uh, watching TV programs, uh, the ones about how it's made, uh, what's involved, and it's not just building products, how it's made. Um, I think it's important, this goes with the uh, limitations, to understand how things are fabricated so that when you see the fabrication process you oftentimes begin to understand uh, more of the limitations. When it's installed, the sequences, the interfaces, what kinds of accessory products are required to actually be able to complete the installation. Think this one's important, Lois? Oh, definitely. <laughs> But this is why I, I think this one's important. Not only do we need to think, but we need to think three-dimensionally. And BIM doesn't do that for you necessarily. You've got to, you still have to be able to do it yourself and, and, and think about those connections. Yes, because with, without being, if you look at the drawing detail, it's in a static place and you need to be able to meander past that static place and see what happens when that starts transitioning to something else. Or even turning a corner. Right. Well, BIM should possibly dramatically change that, or is already changing that a lot, isn't it? Yes, but I think there are always going to be some limitations that uh, it's always going to take a knowledgeable professional to, to be able to see. Yeah, oh, this isn't this isn't going to work when it turns the corner, or you know, this definitely. isn't going to work when it hits the ceiling. Yeah. We've got to figure out something different. And here's one of the limitations we see with BIM. Uh, again, today I'm trying to get uh, project documents 
for a 50% um, construction document submission that's due early February. And they're working entirely in BIM, and the, the attitude right now is I'm asking for current sets of drawings to work from. Uh, the attitude is, well, the current set of drawings were the ones that were issued in August because you know how hard it is drawings out of BIM. Right. And we're not going to get those drawings until we make the 50% submission. So now already we're working with uh, very old information. Right. So I think we need to contribute, and we need to contribute professionally. And not that I'm going to suggest everybody go out and join CSI if you haven't already, but I think you need to pick uh, a place to be involved and I think not only do you be involved, but you need to actively participate. Uh, one of the, probably one of the best things I think I did when I first was involved professionally is I did join CSI, but the other organization that I had joined was ASHRAE. And I'm an architect by training, but I really believe that it was uh, a good thing for me to be involved in something outside of architecture to hear what else is going on in the industry. And I thought that that provided some valuable insight to me. Um, one of the things that I, that I strongly suggest, and even to my own staff when they're attending CSI meetings, is look around the room. See who others are going to for advice and go make friends with them. Go stand next to them. Go listen to what kinds of advice uh, they're offering. Because if others are seeking them for advice, there's probably good reason that they're doing that. And I think the um, the the basic thing, even though if you're if you're involved in CSI, C CSI is a great um, society to belong to because it is multidiscipline. And whether or not you belong to just one or more, I, I think it's important to get out there and get the broad focus, you know, and get some things that are foreign to your training to get you thinking across disciplines. Um, I think all of that comes back to help eventually. Okay, build. And we're not going, not talking about building buildings here, but building networks and relationships. Lewis, I'm going to pick on you. None of us know enough to design a building, not individually. Um, we need to know people who can help us figure out what it is that we, to do. I know enough to ask the right questions about glass, but I know who to call when I need specific technical question about glass or about waterproofing or about air barriers or about roofing. And the only way you can do that is, like David suggests here, is building uh, networks and relationships and having a, that good contact list uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, get the information that we need for our specific project. Uh, and whether they're colleagues that we already work with or product reps or somebody that we worked with a while ago that mentored us, uh, relationships are extremely important to being a successful specifier. Can't have enough. This is your favorite topic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You, you told me it was, so I'm going to let you deal with this one. <laughs> Well, specifiers need to be avid readers, and uh, you know, the, obviously there are specific books about uh, construction-related products that you need to read and and know about. But just in general, you, a good specifier needs to be a good reader, and uh, and I would encourage you to even read you know novels, whether they're mysteries or science fiction or whatever you like to read uh, just for fun um, as a practice. It, it just is helpful if you're the kind of person who finds reading a physically enjoyable uh, 
uh, activity. So, um, of course, there are various uh, reference books that are available, and CSI has a number of different manuals, uh, periodicals, try to keep up with those. Um, there are just, there's lots of stuff, and basically what we do is read, and then we turn around and try to write, we understand it, you have to comprehend it, and then once you've understood it, then you can write a coherent sentence of, about what you've learned. Um, and I can't, I really found the, um, when I became a full-time specifier and I inherited the, my predecessor's uh, manual of practice, um, uh, there was an old gentleman who went home one weekend and didn't come back on Monday for, he passed away. Uh, I found out that, oh wow, somebody has already done a lot of the thinking for me and I don't have to invent this stuff. I can focus on the higher order uh, details of the higher order uh, thinking of product research and so forth and then just delve into the CSI manual to figure out how to express the requirements that I need. Okay. This is one uh, I think that from my own standpoint, was, I was really fortunate uh, that seeking this diverse experience uh, I think is important uh, for a specifier, especially so that you can understand how buildings actually go together. Uh, I actually started out uh, in the construction industry as a uh, laborer uh, laying pipe. Uh, never did work specifically as a contractor. Uh, but did have an opportunity to be a resident project architect uh, that lived on a project site for about two years. So I um, got to see everything that was happening on that site day in, day out, and got to the experience of deta uh, dealing with the contractors, the subs, everybody uh, on that site. And I think that was probably one of the most valuable experiences that I had. So I, I would encourage anybody that's considering being a specifier to seek out these kinds of opportunities if you can. Uh, you're not going to be able to have every one of them, but if, the, if an opportunity presents itself, I think it's worthwhile taking it. Uh, my experience, David, has been a little bit different in that uh, somehow back in the 1980s that my firm uh, got me involved in doing some forensic investigations. Whenever there was a problem, they'd send me out, why is that window leaking? Where is the, the roof leaking? And so forth. And uh, that's uh, helped me better understand how details go together and better understand products as well as being uh, an interesting side venture that I can do. Uh, this year for Christmas, my uh, older two sons brought me, David, a, uh, a bore scope that's got a little electronic screen and a long snake that you can <laughs> put into a, into a wall and look on the inside of the wall. Yep. <laughs> All those little tools are a big help for that. Um, I have a question from sure. Justin. Um, he says, for someone training to be a specifier for a design firm, when there is no specifier on staff currently, where would you recommend finding a mentor of some sort? I am thinking about asking our current independent specifiers, but at the same time, I'm essentially sort of taking his, her work or job. Uh, I'm guessing you're saying there's an independent spec writer working with the firm. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that if there's a, in your case, perhaps if there's a CSI chapter in your area, there's probably plenty of folks there that you could probably tap. Uh, the specifier, depending upon who it is and the kind of personality, they may actually welcome the idea to be able to teach you. Uh, my experience, David, is that once you get a specifier talking, it's hard to get them to stop. <laughs> And so, yeah, you I, and I are perfect examples, aren't we? Well, there's a certain fellow in Memphis that's an even more extreme, but uh, not the. But anyway, we won't. Uh, we'll let Tommy be unnamed. Oops. Uh, oops. Oops. Okay. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, I, one of the great things about CSI is that free interchange of ideas. That 
that specifiers are this sort of uh, uh, underground lodge that we all know the secret handshake and and we share ideas back and forth and you know I'm sure that some of our uh, managers up the line might be a little bit horrified that we think that we're sharing company secrets when we talk to one another, but um, I have never found anybody in CSI who wasn't uh, very willing to share knowledge and ideas and, and, and concepts and spend really quite a lot of time uh, right. in doing that. In your particular case, Justin, you do have to be a little bit careful about, uh, obviously, asking uh, an independent consultant, that's what they do for a living, and you have to kind of be careful about am I asking them for free work. So, but there are other uh, opportunities, other people who would probably be very happy to assist you in your endeavors. Yeah, and just one other thought on that. You may want to check uh, the sp four specs discussion forum because I know there are plenty of <laughs> Uh, very experienced specifiers that frequent that forum and you can probably learn a great deal just by monitoring the forum even if you're not actively participating in the conversation. Oh, that's a great idea, Dave. I might try that myself. I try to read those every, every uh, day just to keep up with all of them. Wow. Uh, so where does all of this end? <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever get to retirement, but uh, meanwhile, this this is what I was trying to get to, Justin. I think that if if you find uh, specifiers out there, I think most of them are willing uh, to teach, and I think that all of us have this obligation uh, to teach whatever we do, whatever we have learned. Uh, we have. Uh, we're spending a lifetime trying to gather all the information ourselves, and we really have to be um, passing that along. You know? And this is one of the things that sort of guides me through all of this, um, and I really do believe this, that it, you know, usually when I have to sit down and actually try to teach something, I end up being the one that understands the subject even better. Uh, so it's while it's providing a service, it's somewhat self-serving too. Yeah, I spent uh, over 20 years uh, participating in the certification training for three different, three or four different uh, CSI chapters, and um, I learned so much as well as I hope providing some help and encouragement to uh, my uh, audiences that it was certainly uh, a very beneficial activity. And for me, here's my next goal is we've got to have that next group of specifiers. <laughs> that 1500 number is not going to grow on it uh, very much on its own and strictly by choice. So there you have it. We're uh, just about on the money here. We have about two minutes left, I see. David, I might. Uh, yeah, why don't you take some questions, if, see if anybody has some questions. Um, I might tell a, a story. Uh, I was sitting at the supper table one night, and my wife, this is some years ago, when my oldest son was 12 years old, and my wife had made some fresh bread in the bread machine, and so I asked uh, Luke to cut me a slice of bread. I said, cut it about as thick as your ring finger. And he picked up the knife and started to cut, and then he looked up at me and said, Dad, you don't have to be specific. And I said, son, with some people it's a job, with me it's a way of life. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Bruno and um, Brian if they have any closing thoughts that they'd like to leave us with. Brian, you'd like to go first? Again, I put you on the spot. Gee, thanks. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I think that you know the information you you put out here is is helpful, and you know it's it's interesting how a lot of these things are kind of things that I already would do. You know, especially the sitting in restaurants and buildings and walking around and looking at things and 
like, oh my gosh, did they really do that? And <laughs> what were they thinking? And that doesn't belong there. Um, so you know, it's I, I, you know, for me, you know, when the, with the economy the way it is and all that, it's it's the the how do you how do you find some place? Because you know, I think a lot of stuff nowadays is is not out there, and I think the building a network and and things like that is probably the way to get into it if you're not already into it, right. and and just finding that opening somehow and and going from there. Bruno. Well, I would end up um, going back to what I said uh, with a thought I expressed earlier, which is that um, <laughs> we end up being good at something, trying to be, we try to be good sa at something, and we end up being even better at something else, uh, and we're quite happy with that. I think that um, I would, for me, a, a specifier somehow seems to be a sort of interpreter. Uh, maybe this is my take also because of my... Uh, biography, but it really means being able to listen, try and understand and, and uh, reformulate and uh, make it clear for um, those who are who the document is addressed to, uh, avoiding misunderstanding, anticipating, uh, identifying possible sources of, of confusion and misunderstanding again, and um, helping um, the whole process to, to run uh, uh, as smoothly as possible. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and we're just now a minute over our time, allotted time. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, and hope to see you all uh, here in February. Our meeting in February is scheduled for the 3rd. It'll be the same time, 3 o'clock. And um, Lewis, I think you had a, a topic uh, that we were considering. We're thinking. We're thinking about uh, talking about decisions, uh, how to make them, how to make the decisions, what decisions should we make versus the, the design team, uh, and just that whole question. So if you've got some ideas along those lines or some uh, specific questions or comments, be sure and send them in to David and me, and, and uh, we will include you in your ideas in the presentation. And we look forward to hearing from you next month. And, and I really, personally, I, I really hope that this has been an encouragement. We want you to get out there and just start writing those specs and, and doing it, because it's a, an important job and needs to be done. Thanks. OK, um, I did thank have you very one much. question um, from Justin. He asked if there are any recommendations on books, et cetera, that are really good at documenting specifically how to go about writing specifications. Well, uh, David is going to make a PDF of this uh, presentation available, and there is actually a list. There is a, uh, a um, textbook written by Harold Rosen, and the latest version, uh, Tom Heineman participated in the revision, and that is an excellent resource. It has been since the late 1970s. It's very well written, very cogent. Uh, the other thing I would say is, um, Buy a copy of uh, Elements of Style by Strunk and White. It's a paperback that's less than 100 pages, and it is the best thing on learning how to write clear, concise English uh, that you will ever read. It's well worth doing. I reread it myself about every other year. So Yeah, and I agree with you. Harold Rosen's book is probably the premier uh, resource for spec writing. Uh, it's actually a textbook that was used um, in a course I had taken by an, uh, a, an old, an old, old time uh, specifier uh, through Temple University, and that was his choice of textbook. It was a great resource. So <clears throat> hope that helps you, Justin. And uh, with that, I guess we'll sign off for today. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Um, you may now.